Hello, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Sussman, curator and Sandra Gilman, curator of photography at the Whitney. And it is my great honor to welcome you all to tonight's conversation between Danny Lyon and Congressman John Lewis, who has served as the US representative for Georgia's fifth congressional district since 1987. We at the Whitney are holding this event in connection with the exhibition Danny Lyon, Message to the Future, now on view on the, fourth, on the fifth floor. This exhibition is the first comprehensive retrospective of Lyon's career in 25 years. The Whitney has a long relationship with Danny Lyon, and six of the works in the exhibition are from our own permanent collection. The exhibition was organized by my colleague Julian Cox, chief curator and founding curator of photography at the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco, and I was very pleased to oversee its installation at the Whitney Museum. Tonight's conversation between Danny Lyon and Congressman Lewis takes place amid wrenching events for this country. The shooting of 49 people at a gay nightclub in Orlando on June 12th, followed by we weeks later by shootings in Baton Rouge, Minnesota, Dallas, and Brooklyn. These tragedies have shaken communities across the country, demanding that we acknowledge and address the racial, social, and political divides that plague our country and that have given rise to decades of violence and loss. Congressman Lewis and Danny Lyon first met in a related period of turbulence and change. In 1962, at the age of 20, Lyon hitchhiked to Cairo, Illinois, where he photographed nonviolent demonstrators at a segregated swimming pool. He met John Lewis, then a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, who encouraged him to continue photographing the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Lewis became president of SNCC soon after, and Lyon continued to photograph marches, mass meetings, and tense confrontations between demonstrators and law enforcement officials. This work laid the basis for Lyon's lifelong commitment to capturing individuals who are marginalized or oppressed in American society. He has produced a body of photographs and films that attest to the complexity, the harshness, and the beauty of American culture in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. The civil rights movement also marked the beginning of the courageous and humane leadership that has made Congressman Lewis a national inspiration in, acknowledge in acknowledgement of his contributions to this country President Obama awarded Congressman Lewis the National Medal of Honor, the highest civilian honor in the US in 2010. In the last few weeks, Congressman Lewis has brought the legacy of the civil rights movement directly to bear on the challenges now facing our country. As a leader of the House sit-in on gun control, initiated in response to the Orlando shooting, Congressman Lewis joined with other members of the House to protest congressional inaction on gun control. House members occupied the floor of the chamber for 25 hours, singing renditions of We Shall Overcome, which began as a slave song in the South and has become an anthem of civil rights protests, not just in the US, but also in countries including South Africa and China. Recent events have also injected a new and a acute contemporaneity into Lyon's photographs. The image you see here, showing the arrest of demonstrator Taylor Washington in Atlanta in 1963, is strikingly resonant today as we are inundated with images in the news and on social media of arrests at protests across the US. We are deeply honored to have Danny Lyon and Representative Lewis with us this evening. Tonight's program pays tribute to their more than 50 years of friendship. At a moment when national action is urgently called for, it also brings together two men 
who, whether through political leadership or through image making, have dedicated their lives to social activism and to bringing greater equality and empathy to our national culture. Tonight's program will be a conversation between Danny Lyon and Congressman Lewis. It will last approximately one hour, at which point Congressman Lewis needs to return to DC. We will save a few minutes at the end of the program for audience questions. Finally, I'd like to thank Congressman Lewis's staff, especially David Bowman, Michael Collins, and Brenda Jones for making today's events possible. And of course, our profound thanks to Danny Lyon and Congressman Lewis for joining us today. Thank you and welcome. Well, I, I get to wear my hat. Can you see? I get, I get blinded. And, uh, it's very difficult to do that and put it down there. Uh, it's very difficult to be with John because everybody ignores me. <laughs> and, you like that picture? I love the picture. I love it. I remember. Right. You know, I took a picture of, I'll just throw this out. I mean, I worked on this for a month, you know. Okay, I remember taking a picture of you in Atlanta. We were roommates and we went down, it was nighttime. And they immediately arrested you, and it's a Rolleiflex, which is a, a terrible camera for, it's just so slow, and, and, and it's a night. And you're laughing. The, the policeman is grabbing you, turning around, and you're just laughing. He, he said, like, oh, it's like he, he knew you so well, the police chief or something, and had arrested you so often. Do you remember that? I mean, you've been arrested. Well, so you know, during those days, Danny, uh, I did get arrested a few times. Uh, <laughs> but first of all, let me just say that I'm very pleased to be here at the New Whitney. Honored to be here with you. You know, I've been knowing you for a while, more than 50 years. That's right. Uh, and I remember when we were roommates, uh, when your hair was black, and I had all of my hair. <laughs> um, you know, you used the bathroom as the dark room. That's right. And uh, I, I was so I was so afraid that one night I would get up and go in to brush my teeth, and I thought I would pick up the wrong fluid. <laughs> hypo, dectal, hypo. Right. Hypo yeah, is bad. But stuff. you were so gifted, and uh, if it hadn't been for you and a few other people. I don't know what would have happened to the American Civil Rights Movement. Have you had drunk uh, Dectol? Oh, no, no, I, I didn't. like Spider-Man. Well, no, I didn't yeah. do anything like that. <laughs> well, so, John, uh, you, you're, you're known for your bravery. But do you know that almost everyone in this room is a Bernie Sanders supporter? <laughs> oh, no, no, I didn't but know no, that. That's but, true, but, yeah. But, well, but, that's but, it. But, so, but you, it, it, you're, it, you're a tough dude. <laughs> I mean, you got guts, man. But it's okay. Sussman is like crazy for Bernie, and I went to school with Bernie. Well, that's it. It's but, okay. Right. It's all right. And I did a blog, and I said, that's it. John's not going to talk to me anymore. But you no, Bernie, Bernie, he's a good man. Bernie is a good man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, John, you probably wondered why we brought, I mean, the Whitney did this, and, and it's actually, there was a reason to bring you here, you, you know. Being a congressman is no fun, and you've done this, how long have you been a congressman? Well, almost 30 years, almost 30 years. 30 years. Almost. Well, we think that's enough. We, we, we brought you here, <laughs> so we, I'm gonna take the, we're gonna switch places. I'm, I'm taking the train. It's all set. I'm taking the train back with Michael, and you are going to be. Free. You can be an artist. You can live in New York, and you'll be free at last. And you deserve it. Nobody deserves it as much as you. You can go fishing, right? Striped bass, everything we're talking about. Well, you know, I love art. You do. You you yeah. have done a great comic book. You collect uh, art. Well, I love. I, I, I wish I could paint, enjoy. <laughs> I wish I could shoot. <laughs> Beautiful photographs. Uh, maybe I will have life after Congress. Maybe 
You will. Uh, Winston Churchill made wonderful paintings, yeah. and he built a house and yeah. uh, all these things. So that didn't seem as funny as I thought it was. You know, <laughs> you, you you thought it was funny in Penn Station. You wanted to do it. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> John, w the sit-in. You, you just sat in in Congress. To, I mean, to get serious. So, so th they say there are no second acts in Amer America, but in fact, overnight almost, you have become the face of the anti-gun movement. And you did it with a very old uh, movement tactic. You did it with a sit-in. And I think it's astounding because you, I mean, this is just me. But, but it's like you took it out of politics and made it into an ethical and moral issue, which was the basis of, of the movement. That was fun to do that sitting, right? Well, I felt... I mean, you like to break the law and cause trouble. No, I like to get in trouble. What I call good trouble, right. uh, necessary trouble. And I went back uh, to some of my uh, old ways, really. Uh, when I was very, very young, I started sitting in. Uh, I saw the signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, right. white waiting, colored, and I didn't like it. And I asked my mother, asked my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, right. why? Right. And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But I was inspired by Rosa Parks and Dr. King to get in trouble. And I tell my colleagues on our side of the aisle, it's time for us to get in trouble, good trouble necessary trouble, and that's what we did. You, you know, I was, you, you know, can we talk about Julian? Yeah. That makes me want to cry, you know, yeah. I just, uh, that's amazing. I, I, I find it very hard to believe he is not alive anymore. Do you feel that way? I, I do, and I miss him. Uh, Julian Bond, as you well know, was one of the bright lights of the American Civil Rights Movement. He was a wonderful friend. And um, it, it's so strange that he's not here, but I think his spirit still live on, and his work has continued to speak to this generation, and will speak to people that are yet unborn. You, you know, the day I filmed, I've been filming John for about eight years, and he's difficult to film <coughs> because it's like trying to film Madonna and thinking you're going to be left alone with her on the street corner, and, and everyone would interrupt us. But the best scene I shot was in that office that day when I asked you that question. Uh, and I filmed Julian that same day or the day before, and I think it was one of his last last pieces. I gave you a copy, and, and I was going to show it, but then I thought, you know, I mean, I made a, I make icons, or you're an icon, so it's like an icon on an icon, but I thought, what's the point of showing a document if, the, if the, I mean, you're John Lewis, you're the real person, right? So what's the point of showing a film if you, you could be here? It's got to be better than what I did, right? I, I mean, know. I just made a film. Well, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if you get that, but that's actually a very subtle I mean, it's real. I mean, I, this whole message of the future, everything I've ever done is about the future, but isn't a real person better than a work of art? I mean, that's this museum. This is a real person, right? Well, you could keep the film. You could keep a, a work of art for, for years to come, right. or for generations to come. But as human, we come on the scene and then we disappear. I'm not disappearing. Well, well, you well, but, were, you Yeah, were, that's what my wife keeps saying, you know. Well. <laughs> yeah, it's true, I guess. Well, um, well I hope someday uh, you would teach us, all of us, right. how you can continue to stay and not disappear. <laughs> okay. I, I, I drifted. You know, I have no, uh, I, I have a very limited attention span. I don't believe that, Danny. Yeah. Uh, not at all. How do you make all these wonderful <laughs> photographs right. and films? Right. I think you Well, photography. I think you're all right. It's yeah. <laughs> well, I, I get bored easily though. But I think you do too. You have a crazy side. I mean, I that's a C well, word. Well, you know, uh,
I, I'd like to be happy. Uh, I don't know whether you saw the video of me dancing to the happy song. I uh, know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like to be happy, and I tell people all the time, be happy. Enjoy life. Right. So never get down. Don't get lost in a sea of despair. So here's a ha happy memory. So we were in Cambridge, Maryland, and, and that was one of the most brutal confrontations of the movement, even though Maryland is actually outside of Washington and not what you call the Deep South. And in fact, it, you know, it was a borderline state or something during the war, the Civil War. And, and you had a, Gloria was there, everybody was there. In fact, some of these tear gas pictures might have been made then, but I, I was there a few times. But it was winter, and you, John did a lot of fundraising for SNCC. He was chairman, and he would have to be like Adam Weinberg. He was like Adam Weinberg for SNCC, and we'd have to, you'd have to go and, and meet with people, and they'd donate money or whatever, friends of SNCC. And there was a thing in Washington, there was a blizzard, I mean a real blizzard, and you couldn't get there, and you suggested I drive you there. The crazy side. So you no, didn't, didn't drive. I didn't right? drive in. That's right. Yeah, it took me a long time to get my driving license. Yeah. When? When? How old were you when you got your license? Uh, forty-two. Forty-two. Well, that's good. That's, that's called a dependency, John. Well, uh, uh, when you like you, that, you, you may know. not know the whole story. Oh, the whole story. Okay. No. When I was sixteen, uh -oh. I went down to get my driving license, and this guy told me, this big guy, I said, "Boy, don't you come back here until you learn to drive." And so I never went back. <laughs> He told me the same thing, you know. Uh, but I, I found my license multiple. I would have licenses from Georgia and Illinois, so when the police stopped me, I'd just give them one of them. I still have a license. <laughs> anyway, so we drove. Do you remember? I had a car. I think my father gave it to me. It was a used Oldsmobile, Oldsmobile but a big, big car, you know, old one. And we went on the turnpike, and it was a blizzard. I mean, you couldn't even see, and at one point, I guess I was a post, I don't know what I was doing, but, but I went off the road, I slid off the road, and I was in the, there's a big grassy thing, like a bowl, kind of in between the two different things, and then I drove down that for a long way, you know, like a quarter of a mile, <laughs> and then was, managed to drive back on the road, and then that's why you're here today, you know. Well. Well, thank you. <laughs> but I was before for, seatbelts. Uh, no, well, thank you for saving us. Yeah, yeah, well, you know. But, but I don't know if you remember that one. Did you meet Ali? Did you get to know Ali? I did, I did. Wasn't it remarkable at his death? His death was like greater, I can't remember an outpouring of feeling since the death of President Kennedy when this man passed. And he wasn't a president. Astounding. And why? He was this incredible ethical leader. Ethical. The, all of it. And everybody bought it. And he was abused. Even me, I thought, what's this funny name? And everybody reacted that way. And he won it all in the end. And, and the response to him, you, you, you know, you, you told me when. You mentioned Thoreau among your inspirations, which stunned me because I'm a big. I'm, neither of us are going back to Congress. I could. I wouldn't last in ten minutes. I would talk about suffering that you got to sit in this room for thirty years. But fishing, I fish in the Maine woods, and I love Thoreau. But Thoreau, talk about you. You, you told me that you have never. I mean, listen to this. We have what? How many members? There are five hundred members of Congress. 535 of us. 535 of us, he said. And John is one of a, John never votes for a military appropriation ever. And he told me once he did it by mistake and he kept it up all night. And I said, how many other American congressmen that you guys elect and everybody elects are like you and, and vote no to war? How many others do that? I don't know, I, I don't keep account. But, I mean, 100, 50, 20? Well, I just think it's important for us to try to leave this little piece of real estate that we call Earth a little more peaceful, a little greener. And for generation yet unborn, war is obsolete. Yeah, we know that, and you know that, and they know that. And what's with the people in Congress who get elected? You told me on film that there were a handful, yeah. a handful of other people who voted like that. 
How, how do you explain that? I mean, are they getting paid? What, what's with them? You know, they think someone's going well, to attack them if they. Well, maybe they march into a different uh, drum beat. Uh, and, and maybe what, they hear something different. Yeah. Maybe it's something in the water that they drink. I don't yeah, know. I'll say. Well, I think it has to do with the media. I think it has to do with how people think. I think people are, are very affected by tele. I'm talking about intelligent, sophisticated people, are very affected by what's in the air. And what's in the air is a kind of poison. And Norman Mailer said something. I only knew, I was in jail with Norman Mailer at the Pentagon March. And I met him once or twice. And he was a New Yorker. Uh, he did go to Harvard, but, you know, I mean, which I, I'd never cared for Harvard. But, but uh, he said that the job was to create myths to replace the rotten American myths. And I think this idea of patriotism and supporting the army is a rotten myth. And, and you are a myth, mythical figure, or you, you're of that stature. And that's what you're doing. And, that's, and I think in my work, I'm trying to say, hey, guys, this is how you ought to take pictures. This is how you ought to run magazines. This is how you ought to make films. So anyway, I, I, I think that's amazing. Do you remember this moment? This is the first time I ever saw you. Can you see this? Oh, here it is, that. Oh, yes. Um, That's you. Yes. You're, you're the one at that in the back. Yeah, I, I know. I know. <laughs> Do you remember taking it? I, I took that in Cairo, Illinois. In Cairo. The first morning. Yeah. So I in, had in 1962. 62, the summer. So I was 22 60. years old. Right. Just. And I had hitchhiked. And you know, this was set up by a freedom of You should know that the, if you were a student who was paying attention, which I was, but I wasn't alone, the freedom riders as individuals had become famous in these kind of underground networks because this event had happened. And it had been, it, it was like breaking out of Auschwitz or something. They did something unbelievable. And there were only about 20 or 40 of them. I mean, well, that was the- Well, Danny, the original group, it was only 13. 13 people, of right. White and African American. Right. Um, we gathered in Washington, D.C. Right. On May 1st, 1961, my first time visiting Washington. May 1st, 1961. 1961. The so same I year President Barack Obama was born. That blind right. people. Yeah, well, he, what was he doing? Nothing, right? Just, he, he, was not, he was not even here. Suckling at a. He was not even a dream. Rest, you he was know. not even a dream. In Hawaii. Yeah. Or where, no, Kansas, excuse me. But uh, black people and white people couldn't board a bus, a trailway bus, right. or a Greyhound bus, and be seated together, right. traveling from Washington, D.C., right. to the South. So we were testing a decision of the United States Supreme Court. And I remember it like it was yesterday. We went to a Chinese restaurant. Now, growing up in Alabama, tennis school in Nashville, I never had Chinese food before. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really you know segregation is one thing, but yeah. it, that's beyond the pale, but you know. We, we we go to this restaurant to, yeah. to eat. I think I think all black people should get free Chinese food. Now. No, no, well, no. Well, I mean, we, come on, we, it's like historic we, justice. You gotta no, make we, up we, for it. We we must pay for our food like everybody else. Oh, you ah, you're being very modest. But though. but <laughs> that night, Danny, someone said in the group, you should eat well, because this may be like the last supper. Right. And along the way, we were beaten, arrested, and jailed. And before the summer of 1961 was over, more than 400 of us had been sent to Parchment State Penitentiary. Had joined was, so, Let me ask you, Paul Brooks, Celine McCollum, yes. are huge in my life at that moment in Chicago and, and Cairo. Were they in the early group or the yeah. later? Group? Yes. They were part of the 13. So this is just kind of amazing. So I'm a student. I don't know from shit from Cheyenne. And I, and I thought Bernie Sanders bored me. I didn't want to say that on my blog. But these guys were just talking. And I saw the sit-in. And I thought they're just playing the real stuff in the South because I knew about you. But so I, I, I make my hitchhike trip. And I have these contacts. And, and, and Charles Neblett and, and, and Celine McCollin, who was a white woman, and Charles was from Cairo. He's a handsome black kind of singer. 
They meet me at the bus, because I'm kind of lost in East uh, where St. Louis, and they bring me to Cairo. So that was one Freedom Rider. And then after this journey, I meet Foreman in the South. I go back, to, and Foreman was from Chicago. He said, we're going to bring you back. We're going to get you money and fly you back again into Mississippi, which is very scary. And Paul Brooks, he's the contact, another Freedom Rider. You know? And I personally, I loved it. For me, you know, that in July of the following year, I actually made contact with the movement. I am so proud of that, of young me who doesn't have much to do with me today, but, but and I, that, that it was so early and kind of amazing. You know. but then you he gave me the money. Paul Book said, here's $300. And I bought a ticket to Jackson. And that, that, but it turned out Harry Belafonte paid the $300. And I'd never met him. And then recently, at the service for Goodman's mother, Carolyn Goodman, yeah. I met him well, at a SNCC thing. And he, he's still a hustler. He said, give me a free book, he said. <laughs> <laughs> the artists are hustlers. Yeah, well, no, 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 well, I don't know about that. No. Yeah, you got it. That's how you survive. You, I don't get a salary. Mm -hmm. OK, <laughs> you go. <laughs> no, I, I, I just think you made a, um, a major contribution to inspire so many people um, to your books, your films, the beautiful photographs. You made it plain. You made it um, real. And because these photographs were shared with people all around America and around the world, they were moved, they were inspired to do something, to say something to move their feet and make a little noise. That is a great thing you, for you, an you, artist to you do. You know, uh, you know, SNCC had a lot of great artists, turns out. You know, for those of you who don't know these stories by heart, I think, is it the second volume of Parting the Waters that tells the story of the Freedom Rides in Nashville? Yeah. Is that is it volume two? Uh, Taylor Branch. Three uh, books. Did, did a two-volume two bi three, three three volume biography of King. King was, I think, actually kind of boring to read about. I'm not making jokes here. And I met Dr. Dr. King a few times. But, but there's 100 pages about what John's talking about, which is the story of the Freedom Rides. And, and is, you cannot put, you think Dostoevsky's good or any of this. Read this 100 pages. It's in volume two. And it begins in Nashville. It tells these stories. And when I read it, I said they should print these 100 pages and put it on the school desk of every eight-year-old in America. It's an unbelievable story of these 13 people and what ha happens and unbelievable tension. You, you were ready to die, right? We were prepared to die. But I mean, you were also yes. ready to die. Yeah, but what we believed you know, in. Yeah, John, it's hard to. You know, I know you started this at 15, is that correct? When, when you well, wanted to go I, to integrate your high school, or whatever well, insanity of, you I, were thinking of? I heard of Rosa Parks. Right. Uh, when I was 15, I heard of Martin Luther King Jr. Right. When I was 17, I met Rosa Parks. The next year, at the age of 18, I met Martin Luther King Jr. Is that when you go to Montgomery? You, you, you then go and meet him? Yes. Or, uh, I wrote him a letter. Right. Uh, I wanted to attend a little college called Troy State College. Right. It's not only a Troy University. Right. They didn't admit black students. Right. And I didn't tell my mother and my father, any of my sisters or brothers, right. any of my teachers. I just wrote them a letter. Right. I said, Dr. King, I need your help. I want to attend Troy State College. He wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket. He invited me to come to Montgomery to meet with him. In the meantime, I had been accepted at a little college in Nashville, Tennessee. An uncle of mine gave me a $100 bill, more money than I ever had. Gave me one of these foot lockers, these upright trunks. On the farm, we used to raise chickens. Right. And as you well know, I wanted to be a minister. And so from time to time, as a little boy, about eight or nine years old, we would you gather would tell, all of our chickens together. You were going to tell the chicken story. In the chicken yard. I want to tell the chicken story. <laughs> and, uh, Didn't we raise any besides chickens? 
Uh, well, pigs we, uh, are, oh, some pigs yeah, and you cow. You didn't talk to them. I you didn't know, talk to them. Pigs are more intelligent yeah, than chickens. Yeah, but, but, the chicken, but the chicken <laughs> did listen. Yeah, well, that's why you're talking to the chickens. And, and, and they were by their head. Pigs to talk back And they would shake their heads. Oh, yeah. Well, they never they, quite stared at men. Yeah. But they tended to listen to me much that's better than some of my colleagues listen yeah, to me well. today in the conference. And some of those chickens were just a little more productive. At least they produce eggs. Would you ever get to be on a farm? You, you know, my mother w was from Russia, and I, I left, you know, I left SNCC, I left everything, and, and I left New York, and I, and, and I went to New Mexico, and I had goats and chickens, and, and my mother come visit me, but she was a Russian. So I thought this was cool, and she says to me, why do you have all these low-level animals? <laughs> because she was the real deal, you, you know. See, I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in Queens in an apartment. My father was a doctor, and it was, you know. So I, I like, you would never do that. You wouldn't live on a farm now, could you? Would no, you I, I love going that? back. I love going back and visiting. In the back, or maybe no, I love going back and visiting, and yeah. going to a little pond, right. a little lake, yeah. and fish. It's boring on farms. Mm. <laughs> well, Oh, the ants fresh, clean, right. you know. Right. Go to a spring and get fresh water. I always wanted to fish water. with you. Yeah, I would well, love to we, fish with you. Yeah, but, but yeah. catfish, that, yeah. that's for you. Yeah. How, how do you catch catfish? Oh, just put the bait on the whole thing. What kind of bait? And just, get, and just it's, throw it's it out. non -violent. In a non-violent way. Yeah, well, you, you know, there's studies now about fish have feelings. Yeah. Well, well, we, well just like. Well, we marvelous hooks. Is that yeah, we probably should uh, find a better way to catch. Oh, uh, don't don't cross that line. Okay. Nobody's taking my fishing pole out of my hands. They're gonna, gonna pry it out of my dead fingers. <laughs> no, I'm really. Okay. So, but they talk now that not only do fish have feelings, but they actually can get attached, like the chickens. They come on and come up. You get to know you and everything. But I don't know when when, when you, you know. I actually liked it when pot was illegal. Because it, you know, there was that buzz that you're breaking the law and you're doing something, and now it's like a medical thing. And you know, yeah. But then I wouldn't know anything about that. Oh I yeah, say. right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and and you know, you you're you, you, you know somebody. I think it was Julian said to me like, and this was like 20 years later. He said, you know, we're just learning our own history. Which me, I th and, and he was, a, I mean, I hate saying he was. He, he is so brilliant, his mind. And, yes. and as he said, and he was an office guy. He didn't really go to the demonstration. So he's a real super intellectual. And what he meant was, and when I lived with you in that apartment with Sam Shira, we didn't walk, I didn't walk in the door and say, hi, you know, my mother was born under the czar. And you didn't walk in and talk about chickens. I mean, you kind of hid that side from I mean, you didn't talk about well, that stuff. You well, had stuff to do, right? It was other things we had to do. Right. We had so, to prepare to organize protests and right, so voter registration drives. Right. And so it, it turned out uh, I'm having a Medicare moment here. I have it's, no idea. It's OK. We all have them. <laughs> you too? No. Yes, yes. <laughs> hmm. do, 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 do you want to have people ask questions? Since we just fell asleep, or I did. I mean, <laughs> you, you know, John. You know, once we had dinner. You know, congressmen often have to have three lunches or four. So I finally was alone with John, and we took us to a great seafood place. And then everybody was interrupting us, and we finally bought the food. And I thought, now I can talk to you about the stamp, and you fell asleep. Oh, I don't remember that. Right, right down a seafood gumbo. Oh. Is there any hope? That there'll ever be a stamp for these three boys who were murdered. Oh yeah, murdered. it would happen. And in the 50th anniversary, uh, so so t two of the three boys who were lynched and murdered over voting rights were from New York City. One was Goodman, whose grandfather helped build the city because he was a huge concrete guy. Another was Schwerner, who was from the Bronx, and I think Andy was a Queens College student. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Mickey Schwerner, uh, James James Cheney? James Cheney Cheney was fr from, from a Meridian, Mississippi. Right. And so years ago, I taught a class at CUNY, and a kid designed a little stamp saying "Died for Freedom." And so, where's the we, stamp? We're going to make it happen. We're going to get the postal service to issue a stamp. And the 50th yeah. anniversary didn't help because no, that's passed. We, we're going to do it. I will and, not leave the Congress. 
until we get it done. Well, we have a promise of a congressman. <laughs> yeah. So we have two mics for questions, and we just ask um, at the request of Congressman Lewis's office and out of respect for the intent of the program that the questions focus on the exhibition and related issues. But if you just raise your hand, we'll bring a mic over to you. Thanks. I don't know. You know, as, as, we, as I look at these images of, uh, of you as a young civil rights leader, um, and you know, now we're in a time where we have a, you know, a new uh, generation of young people who are trying to pick up the civil rights mantle, uh, some of whom identify themselves under the terms of Black Lives Matter. Um, as, as you think about um, the mindset that you had as a young man in, in these photos and you see uh, some of the actions and, uh, and commitment of the young people who are in the streets now, uh, I was wondering what your thoughts are on uh, the, the, what seems to be kind of like a new movement that's emerging to take on uh, the, the, the responsibility of, of being freedom fighters in our country. Well, I have had an opportunity to meet with many of these young people all across America, uh, in Washington, many in Georgia, and other parts of our country. And I've said to them, uh, prepare yourself. Before we went on a sit-in, uh, the Freedom Ride, we studied. Sometime for weeks, months, school year, studying the way of peace, the way of love, the way of nonviolence. Uh, we studied, and then it suggested a Thoreau and civil disobedience. Studied what Gandhi attempted to accomplish in South Africa and later in India. We studied what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the people in Montgomery was all about. We had a wonderful teacher in Nashville by the name of James Lawson, who's now retired in uh, Los Angeles. He was a Methodist minister, uh, born in Ohio. He became part of the Methodist student movement, traveled to India, and he worked for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, FOR. And Dr. King used to say that this young man had a better understanding of the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence than anyone he knew. He was our teacher. And when it was time to start sitting in, we, we were prepared, we were ready. We had test sit-ins in the fall of 1959, and then people started sitting in in Greensboro, North Carolina, on February the 1st, 1960. And we received a telephone call from a young minister there saying, what can the students in Nashville do to be helpful? And Jim Lawson said, we are prepared, we are ready. And we started sitting in, and it spread all across the South like wildfire. And there were hundreds of people in New York City in other places outside of the South that participated in simply protests in support of us. Um, I just said, be prepared. Be willing to negotiate and try to say we must redeem the soul of America. May I comment on y that? Yes. Sean? You know, one of the things, I don't know if Taylor Brand said it or in, in the history I've read, is that hit, when revolutions happen, time is compressed, which means we talk in terms of generations. But, but if you look at the French Revolution and even the American Revolution, and if you look at the SNCC Revolution, what happens in five years normally takes you know, 50 years or 100 years, and time accelerates. And so this amazing moment that, say, we started with Rosa Barr, but started with these 13 men, this, this integrated nonviolent movement moves very rapidly, has tremendous success a as a movement, and then it morphs into a black power movement. And that then basically changes, the, then Black Panthers come in, and then it literally degenerates, and I think that's a fair word, uh, you can, and, and this is over a long period of time. So by 1967 or 8, uh, someone comes into the SNCC office in Atlanta and puts a gun inside James Foreman's mouth, and that's a degeneration. And uh, Michael Thelwell, who is a, a wonderful friend, friend of, of mine who's a Jamaican and can talk about marijuana without any consequences at all because it's a tree in Jamaica uh, and is a good friend, he apologized at, at the Trinity Conference 
to uh, Dottie, uh, who were the last white people who were expelled fr from SNCC. And so I wanted to bring up something about John, because it was an amazing moment. And, and I, of course, was a white member of SNCC, and, and there were lots of them. And a lot of them were Jewish, and some came from New York. And, and you know, we people have written, talked about this stuff. But, but we were at Washington, it must have been 64, and there was a general meeting. Cortland was there, everybody was there. And I remember somebody said, hey, there's a a black power meeting, which was a, a new, and I don't even know if they call it that. I think they probably called it a, there's a nationalist meeting or something. Let's go visit it and, and see uh, what's going on. And, and I, you went. I probably went with you, and Cortland went. And I, I don't know if Ivanhoe went, and a group went over. Do you remember that evening? Mm -hmm. I remember very well. But it may be too long to tell the story. And we probably should get uh, some questions, Danny. Well, I'll but, say it very quickly. They I, wouldn't let me in because I was white. And Cortland went in, and everybody went in. And John said, I'm not going in there. And he walked out with me. Because Thank you. It's a very good point, Danny. Because <laughs> SNCC was, a, from its inception, believed in this idea of an interracial movement. That people that you get beaten with, left bloody with, in the movement, we become brothers and sisters. Uh, my seatmate, when we restarted the Freedom Ride, was a young white gentleman from Beloit College in Wisconsin. We both were left bloody at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery. We had been beaten by an angry mob, and we were close for it even today. He's retired in uh, Arizona. Um, these individuals will become like your family members, like your brothers and, and your sisters. And you cannot deviate. If you believe in the way of peace, in the way of love, in the way of nonviolence, as a way of life, as a way of living, you cannot give up on it. You're not a separate as, as simple as a mean, but as a way of living, as a way of life. Um, but Danny, just this beautiful, Photograph here. I, I love this one. Yeah, because you're in it. You're right I, well, there. I love it. Yeah, I'm in it. It's corny. Hey, John, listen. I, I, I agree with you about love. I hate to say it, but Hillary talks about love, and I like that. And, and you know, I hate. I don't like airports. And I walk through airports. I walk through the Atlanta airport. And I say, I hate all these. I hate the Americans. I look at. And I got off that plane and walked to Atlanta, and this yet another unbelievable carnage had taken place in France. And suddenly, every single person, and Atlanta is a highly integrated airport with lots of African Americans with decent jobs and all kinds of people traveling. And I felt a real love to every single person, no matter if they were thin or fat or what kind of clothing. And it was sincere. And it was because of violence. Because I felt that our civilization is being attacked, I suddenly became a lot less critical about a lot of petty things. And I felt so much true love to every person that only lasted 10 minutes. But sure. <laughs> well, well, it was the, real. Well, you, know, the slogan, you know, the slogan, Danny, for and you lived in Atlanta, is a city that is too busy to hate. Yeah, what a right. change, boy. Yeah. Let's get another question okay, while sorry. we have time. <laughs> and I, I just want to ask you the question that has been dismaying me throughout this presidential season. And that is, it is what the Republicans are saying and what Donald Trump is saying and the race baiting and the racism that has entered the American conversation. But I'm also dismayed that so many people are willing to follow that, to vote for these folks, and to either embrace or at least tolerate those points of view and I'm very interested in hearing you know, your reaction and what you think we can and should do about it. Well, I must tell you, I have followed every election closely since the election of President Kennedy in 1960. I have never seen anything like this, never, ever. <laughs> and sometimes I really think about it, and well, I, I won't go down this road. Um, It's hard for me to believe that this is happening in America. I would like to think that we'll come much farther. Um, 
But what the American people, and especially all of us, must do is not to give up. We got to organize and mobilize and go out and vote like we never voted before. I, I tell young people, college students, high school students, I tell my colleagues in the Congress, and I said it last night on the west uh, front of the, the west side of the Capitol, that the vote is precious. It's almost sacred. It is the most powerful nonviolent instrument or tool we have in a democratic society, and we must use it. There are forces in America today, I really believe this, well organized, well financed, that want to take us back to another period, want to divide people, and there are other forces that are afraid. America is changing. America is changing. We should embrace it. Um, the, but it, there are too many brown people, there are too many black people, there are too many Asian American, there's just too many, there are too many gay people. Many years ago, in the movement, I remember so well when people were asked Dr. King about interracial marriage. His answer was something like, races don't fall in love and get married. Individuals fall in love and get married. So years ago, I wrote an op-ed piece for the Boston Globe. We were talking about the Defense of Marriage Act in the Congress. I said, well, if two guys want to get married, if two women want to get married, it's their business. I'm not a lawyer. I said, but under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, equal protection under the law. You can't say marriage is good for some and not good for everybody. So it's better for people to love and be happy. Really? So what it, I think one day we're going to laugh and look back and say, what was all the fuss about? <laughs> Just let everybody be happy. But I think in the end, the American people will come together and do the right thing. I'm going to do my part. I'll work my butt off, I tell you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I wanted a twofold question and I, one question about art. Uh, first, uh, Danny, the first part is uh, you asked. Congressman, if he was prepared to die, almost as you, you never considered that you maybe were, you know, you prepared to die. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, la you're laughing. But I wasn't on the freedom. No, I, I, that's a very fair question. I was 21 years old. I didn't want to be in the military. I didn't want to be a photographer in Vietnam. I have, I blogged in the first Iraq war, why don't the photographers stay home? Because they say, oh, I'm going to take pictures and stop war. But Hitler's armies had wonderful photographers with them. The SS took incredible pictures in Auschwitz. I'm telling you, the Auschwitz album is one of the greatest works of art to come out of World War II. It was made by an SS officer who had access, and he did portraits of these people who were going to be slaughtered. When I got to Cambridge, that, that same time in Cambridge, that night that they gassed Stokely and they gassed everybody in the streets, and I think they killed a little baby because they, they marched through with, with, with putting gas in, in the, in, in, on the homes where like shotgun houses with porches and it's warm and, and a child died. And I heard something I hadn't heard before. I heard the crack of bullets. And I thought, fuck. That's not a, you know, a club. That's not something I can think my way out of, and I didn't like it. I didn't stay in the movie. I wasn't standing on that bridge with these, you know, with this insanity, you know, and I didn't go to Vietnam, so I was not ready to die. I, I took risks and calculated risks, and it was exciting, but, but there's then a that, difference. He was ready to, to die. But then that leads me to the second part of the question is like, because there's a big separation between people who do, you know, tragedy porn, and there's plenty of that, and people who are out, and they're trying to capture, but they're not bringing to life the subject. And 
rightly said, you know, you brought life to what was a movement that needed to be brought life to so people could humanize it. And so I, you know, I, I asked the first question to lead into the second question, you know, what do you think it really was that really connected you so, you know, viscerally to the subject matter that allowed you, in, you know, not just on the I civil rights movement, but also bikers fan. and, and, right. and in, in, in every wow. case, you, you have this switch. Right. I mean, you live with the congressman, but. Correct. And I hid my marijuana. <laughs> I, 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 didn't, I didn't know that. No, I know, I didn't say that. <laughs> but nobody's here, John. No, Just no, us. I didn't know that. I, I can't totally explain it. It's obvious in retrospect I had a sense of adventure and I love this stuff. Uh, on the other hand, I did leave the movement because I felt I, w I, I, I came of age in the movement. I was young and, and I felt. You know, I, I wanted to photograph white people. I was more, you know, I was growing and all this kind of stuff. But, but you know, again, I do read a lot. I love to read history. And, and there was an argument about, I think Taine is a French historian who photographed, the, he photographed, that's a slip. He wrote about the French Revolution, and which wasn't photographed because they hadn't invented cameras yet. <laughs> but Trotsky argued against because Trotsky, like Churchill, made history, but he wrote history. And he was equally good as a writer. And Taine said the way to write about the French Revolution is to be on the barricades so you have an equal view of the royalists and the revolutionaries. And, and that's how you do it, this kind of objective both sides. And Trotsky says that's nuts. That's the worst place to be. If you're on the barricades, you will be killed. And I was in Haiti, and, and that is the most dangerous place in between the lines. And that was true within SNCC. By being part of SNCC, by being with the Negroes, I had an amazing place to stand as a photographer, you know. But also being white, I could go bullshit James Clark, and I could go back and forth. I could, there were some nasty moments, and I got caught and, and exposed. But, but it was a point of view as a photographer. And then, of course, with the alloys, I, I joined them. So that was part of it. As far as the personal side, I was raised by a black woman named Maddie Brown. I could start crying here because I can't find her. I don't know where she is. But my, Maddie had a child, I think, at 15. She was our maid, which made, we were not wealthy, but she came and worked for us. And I was in love with her. And I published in, a, in an earlier book, The Seventh Dog. My father took an amazing color portrait. Looks like Nan Golden, before Nan Golden was born. Or in 1955, he takes this color portrait of Maddie. And, and she was a huge part, part of my life. My mother taught her to read and write. You know, She was there every day in Queens. You know? And then there's the whole history of the Jews and in my own personal background. And, and there's a historical union under Roosevelt, blacks and Jews. I was kind of waiting for the revolution. And when I heard about it as a kid, I, I was 19, or I heard about Dr. King, I said, God, I'd love to see this. And you know, Susan Micella said to me something. She said, I missed the civil rights movement. I used to feel, think about this, that I had missed the Spanish Civil War. That is nuts. There's a wonderful new book on it. All those guys were killed. They were crazy. They were blown apart. They lost their arms and legs. They were slaughtered. But, 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 but many of them came from New York City. There was a doctor from Beth Israel Hospital where my father worked, where he met my mother, who organized this whole group of people who went out and got blown to pieces. And many of them were communists. So that was this. And I think my mother loved these people and talked about them. And wanting to be my mother's son, I said, that's what I want to do. And when I heard about King, I said, that's it. That's the Spanish War. Go. You know? And I did. Could, and I, could I just say, <laughs> during the 60s in the American South, it was very, very dangerous for a white person to be associated with the movement. Very, but it was really, really dangerous also to be a photographer. If you had a camera, a pen and a pad as a reporter. During the Freedom Rides, when we arrived at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery, they didn't jump on the black and white Freedom Riders first. They attacked the reporters and the photographers. And I shouldn't call the person name, but I read a review of a book, Kevin Trillin, uh, Bud Trillin. Right. Maybe, you know, he, he was working for Time Magazine, based in Atlanta. And 
he was beaten, left bloody right, yeah. in, in the streets of Montgomery. And then they turn on us, right. the Freedom Riders. So it, it was just- Nigger lover. Yeah, that, nigger that's, what they, lover. that's what they said. It was a yeah. nigger lover. Da Danny, could I, could I say, you know, I don't, I don't have a copy of this photograph. You should tell I'll, I'll you, 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 should, you should talk about this photograph for a moment. What? Talk about this photograph just for oh, a yeah, moment. Oh yeah, that's Julian and John, and that's the day after they murdered the four girls in the church. This is standing on the streets in, in, in Birmingham. And the we, day after the, right. we had come and we were standing there looking at these ruins. And, and he was a one of these guys is a writer with the, the Muhammad uh, Speaks. Yeah. And, and the other guy was, a, Julian knew all of these people. And Julian always jokes that his pants were too short. <laughs> and if you notice my tie, now I'm wearing a snick button. And the black and white hand, black. that was a symbol of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You got to go get on the train. Yeah. I think you should let me take your place. Okay. And there's, there's an you better go to the next